Good evening, everyone. Well, we're glad you could make it here tonight. My name is Rose Jansen. I'm with the Academy of Science St. Louis, and we're very pleased to bring you science seminars in partnership with the St. Louis Zoo. Uh, many of you are Academy members and friends. For those of you who are not, I'm going to take just a moment to tell you a little bit about who we are. Uh, we are a local science organization. We're an independent organization supported entirely through community contributions, and we've been connecting science in the community since 1856. It's our mission to promote the public understanding of science and inspire the next generation of scientists and science advocates. We offer a broad range of free and low-cost public science programming, collaborative seminar series, and trips and tours that highlight science at venues throughout the metropolitan St. Louis region. And you can find more information on us and our community-wide events, public talks, and programs by visiting our website at academyofsciencestl.org. You may also visit us on Facebook or Twitter or pick up some of our literature that is outside the auditorium tonight on your way out. If you're interested in helping to support the Academy's many science opportunities for students and adults, there are some membership brochures also outside the auditorium. If you'd like to receive e-notification of upcoming Academy and Zoo public lectures and events, we'll have some e-news sign-up sheets that will make their way around the audience. And if you are a student and you need to verify attendance, we'll have some cards you can pick up from us tonight, also outside the auditorium and after the Q&A. Um, I do want to mention just a couple upcoming events that you might have an interest in attending. And in particular, our next science seminar, which is on the Higgs boson and the fate of the universe. That's Wednesday evening, November 6th. It's right here in the Living World Auditorium from 7.30 to 9 p.m. And the featured speaker that evening is Dr. Joseph Lichen. He's a senior scientist with the Fermi National Accelerator Laboratory in Batavia, Illinois. So uh, again, there are some flyers outside the auditorium on that particular talk. And then here next week, again, in the Living World Auditorium, we have um, a conservation conversation on women, warriors, and witchcraft, carnivore ecology, and conservation in Tanzania's Raha, Ruaha landscape. Um, a couple other events that you might also have an interest in, uh, uh, a talk on to be or not to be, the state of the honeybee. That's an event that is from 1.30 to 3.30 p.m. on October the 11th. It's uh, at the Dennis and Judith Jones Visitor Center in Forest Park. You do need to register to attend. Um, and then one last event on October the 12th. We have a uh, garden tour and farmer's market. It's a walking tour that includes lunch, Green Acres, sustainable agriculture in Old North St. Louis. We'll be taking a look at the 13th Street Garden, um, and you'll have a chance to shop the farmer's market. Uh, again, that's on Saturday, October the 12th from 10 to 12, um, and you do need to register to attend. Uh, the cost is $12 per person, and that does include lunch, and space is limited, so be sure to register early. Uh, so with all of that said, I'm going to go ahead and introduce our speaker this evening. Uh, Dr. Shibu Huse earned his B.S. in Forestry from Kerala Agricultural University, India, and his M.S. and Ph.D. in Forest Science from Purdue University. He is Editor-in-Chief of Agroforestry Systems, Associate Editor of the International Journal of Ecology, and Associate Editor of the Journal of Forestry. He recently served as a Fulbright Scholar conducting research in Bangladesh. He is currently the H.E. Garrett Endowed Professor and Director of the Center for Agroforestry with the Department of Forestry at the University of Missouri, Columbia. Dr. Jose's research program has the overarching goal of identifying and quantifying key ecological processes and interactions that define ecological sustainability. He examines how resources, how resource availability, light, water, nutrients, carbon, and disturbances, management interventions, fire, exotic invasions, influence ecosystem structure and function in agroforest, natural forest, and plantation forest. He uses this information in designing agroforestry systems and restoring degraded and damaged ecosystems. Over the past 20 years, he and his research team have conducted studies in the US, Australia, Costa Rica, Belize, Bangladesh, and India. And he is here with us tonight to talk about fueling the future with sustainable biofuels using Missouri's river floodplains. On behalf of the Academy of Science St. Louis and the St. Louis Zoo, won't you please join me in welcoming Dr. Shibu Jose.
Thank you, Rose, uh, for that lovely introduction. Good evening. Um, it's my pleasure to be here uh, this evening to talk to you all about fueling the future, the role of uh, biomass and biofuels from our Missouri and Mississippi River floodplains. But before I begin, I would like to thank uh, the Academy of Science, St. Louis, and the St. Louis Zoo for giving me the opportunity to share this uh, exciting vision that we have with all of you. I would like to also acknowledge a consortium that we put together that is called the Mississippi-Missouri River Advanced Biomass Biofuel Consortium. We call it Mr. ABC for short. So the idea, the vision that I am presenting today is the collective brain power of more than 75 individuals. So we came together, we put our brains together, and we talked about how can we make biofuels a reality? And our answer to that big question was to put together Mr. ABC. So let me begin by asking the simple question here, biofuels, what are they? I know that we have a lot of students in the audience. So what is biofuel? What is your understanding of biofuels? Well, I have the definition right there, but before you read the definition, I would like to hear if someone can answer what is biofuel. Well, it's there in the name itself, biofuel. Fuel derived from biomass. Well. So it's a renewable fuels made from plant and animal-based materials. So it could be like grasses, trees, oil crops like soybean, for example, or it could be discarded vegetable oil, or even animal fat that can be converted to some sort of a fuel that could be used for burning, to produce bioenergy or it could be produced as a drop-in biofuel to run your vehicles or fly the jets. So what is fossil fuel then? The petroleum that we use today, what is it? Well, I'm sure all of you know what is fossil fuel derived from fossil. What kind of fossil? Well, when you think about it, that's also biomass. Biomass from plants and animals that lived millions of years ago. Well, under high temperature and high pressure, they were converted to the petroleum and the multiple products that we use or we derive from crude oil. So if you think about it, that is also biomass-derived fuel. So if you look at why do we talk about biofuels these days, and what is the difference between biofuels and, and fossil fuels, why do we believe, at least some of us, that fossil fuel or biofuels are much better when it comes to carbon dioxide emissions? What is the difference there? Well, CO2, carbon dioxide, is the chief byproduct of fossil fuel combustion. And it is a major greenhouse gas. I'm sure that all of you know that. So I've given some interesting statistics here. So in the US, the burning of coal for electricity 
more than 22.4 billion tons of CO2 per year into the atmosphere. Look at this number here. The average American car spits out about 12,000 pounds of CO2 per year. And keep in mind, we have nearly 250 million cars on our roads. So we are putting out a lot of CO2. There is no question about that. And there is evidence that CO2 is a major greenhouse gas and is responsible at least partially for increasing temperature in the atmosphere. So if you are burning biomass, well, burning fossil fuels put CO2 into the atmosphere. It's a well-known fact. How about if you burn biomass? If you burn plant biomass, for example, like think about a bale, a round bale, or think about wood chips that you burn in a biomass power plant. Are you not putting any CO2 into the atmosphere? You are putting carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, right? But still, we call biofuels carbon neutral. What does that mean? Why do we call them carbon neutral? Well, there is still CO2 coming out when you burn either biomass directly or some sort of a drop in fuel produced from biomass, like biodiesel or ethanol or butanol or even biojet fuel when you, when you burn. Well, they emit CO2. But how come they are called you know, carbon neutral? Well, the difference is when you burn fossil fuel, you are releasing carbon dioxide that was fixed millions of years ago. And that remained fixed, but then now you are bringing it and you are releasing it into the atmosphere. So there is a positive effect. You are increasing the net carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. But if you are burning biomass or biofuel, that biomass and that carbon was fixed from the atmosphere, perhaps during the last growing season. So the carbon was fixed during a three month or four month or one year, or in a couple of years from the atmosphere, and now you're releasing it back into the atmosphere. The plants will grow again, recapture that CO2, and then you make some sort of a biomass-based fuel and CO2 is put back into the atmosphere. So that cycle keeps going. So there is no net increase. You take it from the atmosphere, you pump it back into the atmosphere. So there is no net increase in CO2. And that's why we call it carbon neutral. It's not because CO2 is not being released. So now why we need to worry about biofuels or what is why is the importance on, on biofuels so much these days? Well, it is directly tied to national security. And I have a quote from then Senator Obama. He said back in 2006 at the governor's ethanol coalition meeting in Washington, D.C., that energy security is national security. And it is very much true. Look at the statistics here. In 2011, five out of 10 gallons we pumped in our cars came from a foreign country. And we experienced pr price fluctuations at the pump very frequently tied to global events. So back in 2007, we came up with an act called ISA, Energy Independence and Security Act, which mandates us to use 36 billion gallons of biofuels by 2022. 
and that is fourth of the petroleum consumption in 2009. And look at this number here, 21 billion gallons out of the 36 must come from some sort of advanced biofuels. So we talked about biofuels. Now what is advanced biofuels? Well, advanced biofuels are, I'm sure all of you are familiar with corn-based ethanol or soybean-based biodiesel, right? Are they advanced biofuels? No, they are the first generation biofuels, not advanced biofuels. So the advanced biofuels are like lignocellulosic biofuels. That means produced from biomass, like the switchgrass that you see along the roadsides, or the willows and poplars that we see in our floodplains. Can we convert the plant biomass into some sort of a liquid transportation fuel? Those sort of biomass or, or biofuels. They are the ones called advanced biofuels. And here is another part of that definition. 60% reduction in greenhouse gas emissions compared to gasoline. So, So now let's look at, you know, who is using biofuels? Is there a demand for biofuels out there? Well, if you are pumping gas into your car, you know, 10% in most, most gas that you buy, 10% is ethanol, biofuel. But that is corn-based ethanol. If you look at some major industries, like the aviation industry, for example, you will see they have declared, some of them at least, or transportation industry, you will see that they have declared that they would like to use biofuels. It could be to reduce their carbon footprint. In most cases, that is the case, that is, that is the truth. Look at FedEx, for example. They aim to use 30% biofuels by 2030. If you look at United Airlines, they announced this past summer their intention to use 15 million gallons of biofuels in the next three years. If you look at Department of Defense, by the way, they are the largest energy consumer as a single entity in, in, in the US. They use 117 million barrels of oil at a cost of $17 billion according to the 2011 statistics. And again, you can see the national security implications here in this statistics. If you look at Air Force, that is 53% of this number here. Navy, 28%, Army, 18%, and Marines and Coast Guard, about 1%. Look at this, a 25 cent per gallon increase would cost the Department of Defense one billion dollar increase in fuel cost. So I'm sure you can clearly see the national security implication here. Air Force is seeking to use 50-50 biofuel blend in all aircraft and 50% domestic aviation fuel from alternative fuels by 2016, and that is right around the corner. Navy plans to use 50% liquid fuel from alternative sources by 2020. So you can see there is going to be a lot of demand for biofuels in the near future. So what you see here in this graph is the corn-based ethanol and the production levels and the future forecast. So you can see that we produced about, well, 12 to 13 billion gallons as of this year. 
Well, it can go up to about 15 billion gallons, according to the Energy Independence and Security Act. Keep in mind, out of the 36 billion, 21 billion must come from advanced biofuels. And that is what you see in this graph here. Let's see what is happening in terms of the production of advanced biofuels from lignocellulosic, that's, that means biomass, in the US. In 2012, EPA had estimated that we would produce, the production goal was up to half a million gallon. Well, the target was 500 million gallon. But the actual production was less than 0.5 million gallon. So the target in 2012 was 500, and we produced less than half a million gallon. What happened? Where did we go wrong? We've been doing research. We were hopeful that we would have that kind of production coming out by 2012, but that hasn't really happened. So what's going on? Well, there are two major bottlenecks. It's not just me speaking, but if you ask any expert on this topic, most likely they would recognize, well, there are many bottlenecks, but two major bottlenecks. The first one is the sustainable supply of biomass. And the second one is cost-effective conversion technologies. Keep in mind, biofuels have to be produced from the raw material biomass. So first of all, we need to have the biomass. And you may wonder, what is the big deal? You drive around, you see plenty of biomass, right? And you see plenty of biomass in the river floodplains. So what is the big deal? We have a lot of forests. We have a lot of grasslands. We have a lot of crop residue. So we should, have, you know, we should be able to get a lot of biomass. Well, biomass, when you think about it, is a low density feedstock. You cannot transport that biomass very far to convert that into some sort of a biofuel. So the availability of the biomass is a problem. You can probably get it one time or two times or three times, but can you keep on harvesting it for the next 50 years, for the next 100 years? Can you count on that biomass when the industry sets up shop, the refinery, to convert that biomass into some sort of a biofuel. Can you count on that biomass to be available for the next 50 years? That is the real question. You see the biomass, but can we keep harvesting it on a sustainable basis for a long term? Well, that is a major bottleneck. The next one, of course, is conversion. So there are two kinds of conversion processes. One is thermochemical. That means under temperature, under pressure, you convert biomass into some sort of a biofuel, or you can just simply burn and produce steam or electricity. You can use it for combined heat and power. So using this thermochemical, we can do what nature did. Well, it took nature millions of years to convert the biomass into petroleum. We do have technologies available today that can be used to convert plant biomass into petroleum in a matter of seconds. So thermochemical. Well, we also have biochemical processes we can take the cellulose in the biomass and use enzymes and convert that cellulose into some sort of sugar 
And then once it is sugar, you can ferment that to produce ethanol or butanol or even convert all the way to jet fuel. So pre pretty much every product that we get from petroleum, all sorts of chemicals, all sorts of fuels, we can make out of plant biomass. And this picture that you can see that is switchgrass. So the grasses and trees that you see, we can do that. We do have the technology available today. But there is still a bottleneck. Are they cost effective? Can we produce the biofuels at a price that is competitive at the pump? For example, butanol. We do have technologies to produce butanol from any kind of biomass. And butanol is a drop in fuel, just like ethanol. And if you look at the chemistry, it is better than ethanol in terms of its energy content. And we can use existing pipelines to transport butanol. Ethanol, because of the high moisture content, you cannot do that. It will corrode the pipelines. Butanol, you wouldn't do it. And you can also use butanol at a higher percentage to blend with gasoline. Well, if you search for butanol, you will also see stories of people using 100% butanol in existing engines without causing any damage. Well, we haven't done any research to, you know, at least in my program, we haven't done any research, but you can see claims like that with butanol. It's a drop in fuel. But butanol as a chemical you can get $6 per gallon. So how is it possible then to bring that product to market for $3? Will anyone do that? They will sell for a chemical for $6 rather than selling it as fuel for $3 per gallon. Well, look at these numbers here. From a ton of biomass, and these are pellets made from switchgrass, by the way, that is densified biomass. So from a ton of biomass, you can produce about 80 gallons of fuel. And an acre can produce about 10 tons. And that is the high end at this point. Not all crops can produce 10 tons of biomass every year, no. Switchgrass, in most cases, would produce anywhere from three to six tons. So if you can produce 10 tons, that is 800 gallons of fuel coming out of one acre. So if you have 100,000 acres, that is a million ton of biomass, you will get 80 million gallons of biofuel in theory. And let me show you where we can improve the production efficiency. Well, why can't we produce like 100 gallons from one ton? Well, we can but we need to do more research to increase, first of all, the efficiency of that conversion, either thermochemical or biochemical. Can we produce more sugar out of that cellulose? That is one key. We can also produce more tonnage. Who said we can only produce 10 tons per acre? There are some crops that can produce up to 15, 20, tons per acre per year? Can we improve the production potential of some of these other native grasses and trees to maybe 20 here? Well, it is possible. Science can do these things. And there is a lot of research going on to look at all these possibilities. How can we increase the efficiency and bring the cost of biofuel production down? so that a gallon of biofuel would cost the same or lower than regular gasoline. So there is room for improvement. That is the moral of the story here. So growing the biomass. Why the Mississippi-Missouri corridor? Let's look at this particular corridor. 
Because I'm talking about the fueling the future using the floodplains. So let's look at this landscape here, the floodplain, the Mississippi River and the Missouri River. What you are looking at here is a map of the U.S. with the production potential shown in different shades of green. So greener the color means greater the production potential, biomass production potential, that is. So if you look at this, you will see that the Midwest has perhaps the greatest production potential. No wonder. If you go down here, the bottom of that corridor also has got great production potential. But there is a problem here. This upper part of the map here is the food basket or the bread basket of the United States, as we know. And down here is the wood basket. They produce a lot of wood down here. So there is that debate always, food versus fuel. If you are going to use the land that we use for producing food to produce this sort of biofuel crops to produce the fuel, then where are we going to produce our food from? And there was a statistics that I failed to point out earlier. You saw that in, in, in 2011, we used about 40% of the corn that we produced in the U.S to convert to ethanol, 40%. And that is a food crop. And now, I'm talking about converting land in the floodplain, some of the most productive land. That's what at least you would think when you see a map like this, to grasses and trees, and harvest them and convert to biomass and biofuel. Well. Let me also point out another statistics and make it clear that I'm not talking about converting productive land into biomass crops. If you look at this corridor from Minnesota all the way down to the Gulf of Mexico, we also have nearly 120, let's be precise here, 116 million acres of marginal land that we can use to grow the grasses and the trees to produce biomass for biofuels, the raw material for a biomass-based industry. So that is that corridor. Let me also point out some other strategic advantages that we have in this particular corridor. We do have a lot of existing industrial infrastructure already in the corridor. And this is a 75 mile buffer on both sides of the river, okay? Going up all the way to Minnesota and here just the Missouri part of the Missouri River. And you see a lot of different colors here inside. Some are purple, some are green, and some are rectangles, some are circles. And they are all existing either ethanol plants or biodiesel plants or chemical factories. And all the green dots that you see up and down, those are barge ports. So we have a unique infrastructure, existing infrastructure. So with little investment, we can retrofit some of the existing chemical factories or refineries into advanced biorefineries. And we cannot do that in many parts of the US. So we have that unique advantage here. And also when you think about, I told you earlier that biomass is a low density feedstock, you cannot transport it very far. So we don't need to transport biomass very far when you think about, we have multiple major transportation hubs starting from 
uh, Minneapolis, St. Paul, then coming down to St. Louis, Kansas City, Memphis, New Orleans, you name it. Major hubs where we can utilize biofuels produced locally without transporting up and down. But if you need to transport up and down, well, we have something that many regions in the U.S. cannot claim. Another advantage, existing and cost-effective transportation network. Well, of course, we have railroads and highways, but I'm also talking about the barge system. And look at this. Living here in St. Louis, I'm sure you, you are familiar with the 15 tow barges. So a single 15 tow barge or barge tow can replace over 1,000 large semi-trailers from our highways. A gallon of diesel can take a ton of biomass nearly 600 miles on a barge compared to only about 155 on a highway. So you can see the efficiency in transporting that biomass or even the biofuel or other bio-based products up and down the river corridor where it is needed. We can do that very cost effectively compared to many other parts of the US. And also we have existing investment made in universities, in federal labs, in state agencies. We have invested millions and we compiled some of the data and came up with about 70 million in R&D at universities um, alone. But there are billions of dollars of investment in the private sector too. And these investments are in trials, looking at productivity of these crops. Where do we grow them? How do we grow them? What kind of biomass do we get? Can we make them more productive? Asking these sort of questions by major universities. Starting with again Minnesota, going all the way down to the Gulf of Mexico. Major universities are part of this Mr. ABC. We are trying to work together to share data, information, to help us learn from each other and produce more biomass and make the production of biofuels more efficient. You can also see federal agencies, state agencies working together. And we also have what we call advanced rural biorefineries. And I will explain to you what an advanced rural biorefinery or an arbor is. We call it the arbor model. So what is an arbor model? It is a decentralized production processing system. Well, many years ago, we were thinking of huge refineries to produce biofuels. But keep in mind, again, transporting biomass is expensive. You cannot transport biomass more than 50 to 75 miles to convert that into any sort of biofuels. So it has to be less than, well, ideally less than 50 miles. So a decentralized production processing system has a footprint of, let's say, 50 miles. So farmers grow the biomass, bring them to a central processing facility where that is converted to a, you know, some sort of a biofuel. So the production capacity is not like hundreds of millions of gallons, but tens of millions of gallons, like 10 to 15 million gallons. So a small rural facility 
that produces the biofuels, which can be then utilized in the rural communities. So that is the model that we envision. And we do have some examples in Missouri and in Tennessee. So the advantage of that model is it is replicable. The footprint is small, but then you can have multiple arbors up and down the river corridor. We can easily scale up the production to, let's say, 100 to 150 million gallons in the near term. It could be up to billions of gallons if we can replicate this model successfully up and down the, you know, the river corridor. And again, this is a corridor that needs an economic boost. Farmers are looking for alternative crops, and I will explain to you in a second here when I talk about some of the research that we do, why farmers are looking for alternative crops. Why do we need to revitalize the economy in this river corridor? Well, so these are the major lines of research that we do at this point to support this arbor model. Again, keep in mind that is the scale-up strategy that we have for scaling up the biomass production and the biofuel production in the river corridor. So we need to grow the biomass and we need to find a sustainable way of growing the biomass so we can guarantee the supply of that biomass year after year. We are focusing on developing cost-effective conversion strategies, the second major bottleneck. And then we are also focusing on conducting the sustainability analysis of the whole production processing system, not just producing the biomass or the biofuel, but the system as a whole. So the first goal, to grow this biomass sustainably. So we are focusing on a certain suite of species, not all kinds of plants, but we have selected a few that have the highest biomass production potential. And I've listed a few of them here. This is willow. It's a native plant that you would see in the bottom lands. Comes up naturally, but we can also improve the biomass production potential of willow. Well, this is another one, cottonwood. Well, switchgrass, a native grass, but we also are working with other grasses like Indian grass, big blue stem. And here is sorghum. I'm sure you have heard of uh, sweet sorghum, but there is also a sorghum called biomass sorghum, and that biomass sorghum can produce up to 15 tons of biomass per year. And the sweet sorghum, for example, the, the juice can be extracted just like from sugar cane and converted to ethanol or butanol or jet fuel. And this is energy cane. And here is miscanthus. I'm sure you have heard about MFA oil and their BCAP project. How many of you have heard of that? Not very many. Well, the federal government has got an assistance program called Biomass Crop Assistance Program, BCAP. And in, in, in Missouri, there are two BCAP project areas. One led by Show Me Energy Co-op from Centerview, and the other one with MFA oil. MFA oil has landowners planting this species here that is miscanthus, can produce a lot of biomass in one growing season. And Show Me Energy has over 600 landowners growing native grasses mixed with legumes and other herbaceous species on over 20,000 acres. And right now they are converting that biomass into pellets, but with the hope of producing some sort of liquid fuel in the near future.
So now, these crops can be grown on marginal land. So what is marginal land? It is extremely important for you to understand that, again, we are not focusing on productive agricultural land for growing these biomass crops. We are targeting what we call marginal land. So how do you define marginal? Marginal for what? Well, marginal for growing our typical rock crops like corn or soybean. What you are looking at here is a picture from southeast Missouri. And you may recall what happened in May of 2011. We had to intentionally breach the levee, the Birds Point levee. What happened as a result? 130,000 acres of farmland was underwater. And that is, again, farmland that was used for corn or soybean or, or other crops. But after the flood, you can see these sandbars, several feet of sand deposited on productive land. Is that productive anymore? Probably not. Pr not productive for corn or soybean. But some of these crops that we are talking about, like switchgrass, willow, for cottonwood, they can grow even on sandbars like this. If you go to the floodplain, if you have a sandbar, most likely you will see willow still growing on a sandbar. Even if it is five feet, 10 feet deep, willow will be still growing on it. So it's not marginal for these crops. It's marginal for raw crops. So this land like this can be utilized productively to grow biomass and to convert that biomass into some sort of biofuel. Well, this is what happened not this past summer, the summer before. We had a record drought. A lot of our farmlands looked like this. Right? You remember that? I'm sure you remember that. Well, we do have a lot of land where the top soil is almost non-existent. It could be just a few inches, or it could be nothing. It may be just clay. And land like that could be easily subject to drought. Well, this drought was a historic drought. I don't think any land escaped from that sort of a drought, or could escape. But when the soil depth is very shallow, that is also marginal. Most agronomic crop like you know, corn or soybean cannot really grow. And let me show you that through a, through a graph here. If you look at corn production as a function of soil depth, this is the A horizon soil depth, you will see that productivity of corn will increase as soil depth increases. So if you look at, if you conceptualize that, you will see here in this graph, if you look at soil depth and your economic return, and if you are growing corn or soybean, most likely, if the soil is shallow, you may still be growing your corn or soybean, but you are not making any money. It's actually negative return. But at some critical depth, of soil, you will start making money because beyond that soil depth, well, corn crop is pretty good. You may be getting 150 bushels an acre. Well, look at this line, the green line here. It never goes below that net economic return equals zero line. It is always positive. And what is that? That is a mixture of native grasses. 
And this is based on a trial that we are conducting at the University of Missouri on one of the farms. You can see that even when the soil is even when the soil is shallow, and even when there is no topsoil, you can still grow switchgrass, Indian grass, big blue stem, and still produce biomass. And it is still economically feasible to do so. You still make a net return on your investment. So on marginal land like this, you may be better off by growing those crops rather than putting corn or soybean. So that is the kind of land that we call marginal, where you can clearly make a profit by growing grasses or trees. But if you try to grow corn or soybean, well, you lose. You lose money every year. But if you look at this picture here, when you drive around, you see farms like this all over, where a part of your farm may be always flooded like that. Even with a slight rain, half an inch rain, well, there is water there. So on farms like that, well, it could be a thousand acre farm, but your hundred acre is always flooded. But you keep growing your corn or soybean even on that particular hundred acre, because that's all you do. That's all what you know about. So you do it as a farmer. But you lose money on the 100 acre every year probably because it is wet and you cannot get a crop out of there or your productivity is below that line there. Well, if you put your switchgrass, if you put your willow, most likely you will get a good economic return out of that land, which otherwise is unproductive for growing corn or soybean. So if you consider land like that, you can say that we do have plenty of land like that, that is marginal, where we can grow biomass. And the plants that, that I described, the willows, the cottonwood, the switchgrass, the Indian grass, big blue, they all love plenty of water, by the way. So they can easily grow on land like this. So what are we doing in terms of improving some of these planting stock? Well, we are screening multiple species, poplars, willows, switchgrass, sorghum, Indian grass, big blue. The goal is even though they are flood tolerant and most of them are drought tolerant, we can still improve the productivity by screening, by exploiting the variation in nature. Not all switchgrass is made the same. Some are flood tolerant, some are not. So we are trying to find which is the best in terms of flood tolerance, which is the best in terms of drought tolerance. Well, can we combine the flood tolerance and drought tolerance into one single switchgrass plant? So whether it is rain or no rain, they will do just fine and produce a lot of biomass. Well, we have some cool facilities like this greenhouse, for example, it sits on, uh, well, in fact, railroad, so they can move back and forth. We can exclude rain in the field and study drought tolerance. This is a flood tolerance lab where we can actually look at flood tolerance in the field by flooding. And we can control the duration of the flooding. We can control the depth of the water. We can make it either stagnant water, mimicking you know, water logging, or we can even make it flowing water. So we can control all kinds of, or create all kinds of scenarios here in the lab. We are also looking at production systems Rather than just planting monocultures, can we mix species? Is switchgrass by itself better in producing biomass than combining with Indian grass, big blue stem, the legumes, like you see in nature? 
So we are looking at all sorts of different combinations. What gives you the best productivity and long-term sustainability? Do we really need to add nitrogen? Well, the picture that I showed earlier, when you have flooding, what happens to all the chemicals that you have already applied to that particular corn or soybean? Some of it is washed into the river systems, right? You go back into your property, you disk the land, you plant your crop, you apply the chemicals, and there comes the flood. So that 10% of your land that is close to the creek is flooded. What happens to all the loose soil and all the chemicals bound with that sediment? Well, they end up in the river. If you plant something like this, these are perennial plants, willows, switchgrass, cottonwood. They stay there. You only plant it once. You don't need to disturb the land every year. You don't need to replant. You plant it once, but you harvest every year. So you are trapping a lot of the nutrients coming off your ag, ag fields. Nutrients that are taken by these switchgrass plants, cottonwood, willows. So you don't need to apply any special nutrients to these plants because they are already trapping most of these nutrients in that low area on your farm, coming off, washed off from your upland farmlands. So they trap the nutrients, you harvest them, and you remove them before these nutrients end up in the river. So you clean up the river big time if you have these perennial plants on your farm. So in addition to providing the biomass, they also provide you a lot of environmental services or ecosystem services, cleaning up the water. And what is the cost of clean water? It's priceless if we can use these plants to clean up our water bodies. Anyway, we are looking also at this sort of production systems where can we combine trees and crops together for the same reason. The herbaceous plants may take up only nutrients from certain depth in the soil, but if you have trees, they have deep roots and they may take up even more nutrients before these nutrients reach the river systems. So in the floodplain, that is important. So if we can use this strategy to clean up our rivers, that would be a great thing. And we accomplish that while growing the biomass for an emerging bio-based economy. Here is another way to improve productivity of plants, genetic engineering. And here is a switchgrass that folks from California, the Joint Bioenergy Institute at Berkeley, the scientists made this particular switchgrass by inserting a gene that you normally would see in, in corn into switchgrass. And what is the result? Why do they do that? They were trying to look at, well, if you produce a lot of biomass, that is one way to produce a lot of sugar from that biomass. But you can also produce a plant with a lot of sugar in it. So even if you don't produce a lot of biomass, you are still getting a lot of sugar. So can you produce a plant with a lot of sugar in it? Well, they did that. But it is a GMO. We are not ready to plant plants like this in the field yet. So that is for probably down the road. In the distant future, we may see plants like that. But at least in the foreseeable future, we are dealing with plants that are natural. But can we make them more productive? Can we improve the sugar content by breeding them? The conventional breeding, rather than inserting genes. So we are looking into that in our program. But I just wanted to let you know that there are other groups focusing on the GMO route as well. 
and increasing the conversion efficiency. Again, would like to point out that there are biochemical as well as thermochemical conversion strategies, but we are focusing on improving conversion efficiency. Conversion from cellulose to sugar, that is what we are focusing on in our program. We are also focusing on producing new enzymes. So we have scientists like Gary Stacy looking at new enzymes, and we have faculty members like Chang Ho Lin, Katesh Karti, and I'm also working with that group to make the conventional enzymes more efficient. And we are using some technologies and we have some startup companies focused on that enzymatic conversion, the biochemical conversion. Right now it costs about anywhere from 40 to 50 cents per gallon in enzyme cost to produce biofuel. But our goal is to bring that cost down to less than 10 cents a gallon. Let's see if we will be successful. We have some early success, but we are trying our best to improve even further to bring the cost of biofuel production down. And again, technology is advancing fast. Late last year, early this year, you could say, we had Kior producing biofuels by thermochemical conversion at a commercial scale, and they are out of Mississippi. And this is the process that I said, what nature did in millions of years, man is doing that in seconds. That's the process they are using. You can also see butanol production from biomass and commercial like this initiative here, the Midwest Aviation Sustainable Biofuels. It's led by United and Boeing. So we do have a lot of exciting things happening in the biofuels world. It is becoming real. And the river corridor can play a big role, a major role in providing not only the biomass that is the raw material, but also producing that fuel right here in the corridor. I also want to point out that it's not just the, you know, the fuel that we can produce from this biomass, all sorts of chemicals once you convert that into sugar. Pharmaceuticals, nutraceuticals, cosmetics, and even the flat screens that you use on your TV or you see um, on your computer. I don't know how many of you realize that fiber coming out of trees is one of the major raw material for making LCD. Well, this is our last goal, looking at the sustainability of the whole production processing system. So we are looking at the whole supply chain, starting with farmers all the way through end users. How does it all work together? Where can we improve the efficiency? Do we need to reduce that 50 mile radius down to 25 miles? Will that make it really work then? Is that going to be the, the breaking point? Or where can we increase the efficiency along the supply chain to really make it work for everybody involved along the supply chain? So we do have economists, policy folks, ecologists, working at not only the economic sustainability, but also the environmental and social sustainability of the production processing system. And these are the multiple players that we are looking at. And I just want to show you one slide here just to demonstrate the point that I was trying to make earlier. When it comes to environmental sustainability, I would like to emphasize that and drive that message home. If we can plant, I told you that we have 116 million acres of marginal land, land that is frequently flooded, or land where the top soil is even non-existent, or the land that is subject to drought all the time, where you cannot really get a crop out of it, you know, like the corn or soybean crop, but we can get 
switchgrass or willow or cottonwood out of it? If we can plant up and down on 10%, keep that in mind, 10% of the 116 million acres, we can clean up the river system. And let me explain that again. Look at this graph here. That shows the nitrogen that is coming off our farmlands into the Missouri River, well, into the Missouri and Mississippi River. Well, all of that nitrogen will eventually end up in where? The Gulf of Mexico. And here is another graph that shows what percentage is contributed by the farmland in nitrogen. It is about 70% contributed by ag operations overall of the nitrogen that ends up in our river systems. 80% of the phosphorus ending up in our water also comes from ag operations. So 80% of the phosphorus, 70% of the nitrogen. Guess what? Once they reach the Gulf, Something happens there every year. Do you know what is the name of that phenomenon? It's called hypoxia. How many of you have heard of hypoxia? Okay, so some of you know what is hypoxia. What is it? Can someone give me just, just a quick one phrase definition for hypoxia? Yes. The yeah, the dead zone. So who is dead? Everything, everything in the water is dead. Why? No oxygen. What happened to the oxygen in the water? Algae. Well, very good, you know the answers. Yeah, so all that nutrient, you know, the nitrogen, the phosphorus, they all end up here, and that creates the algal bloom. Well, the oxygen is taken from the water, everything dies. And it causes billions of dollars of ecological and economic loss in the Gulf every year. And worldwide, now we have a lot more, over 400 hypoxic zones like that. And our hypoxia zone is not shrinking, it is, it is becoming bigger and bigger. Can we shrink it? Yes, we can. Again, here is the solution. So we can produce the biomass and we can clean up the river systems. And here is actual data. This is corn and soybean and how much nitrogen, mm -hmm. nitrogen is going into the, the river or into the water actually. And if you have switchgrass or poplar, that is cottonwood, Look at these lines down here. It is much less when you have those crops growing compared to corn or soybean. So you can have 20 to 80% reduction in nutrients and sediments going into the water if you have these perennial crops grown on your farm. And it doesn't have to be, again, on all of your farm, you know, like all 1,000 acres, not necessarily. You put these crops in sensitive areas, like the corner that I showed you earlier, along the river, where you know that it is going to flood, perhaps three out of five years. And you don't get a crop out of it. Well, you grow these crops, these plants, and you can, you can bet on a positive economic return. Well, I will just wrap up. Let me show you a couple of more slides. This is kind of a summary of all the research that's happening now at the University of Missouri. And we do have multiple partners in the US as well as overseas now we are working with on projects like this, looking at biomass and biofuels. So we have research going on in feedstock. We have research going on conversion. We have research going on sustainability. And these are some of our funding partners like Department of Energy, USDA, National Science Foundation, one of the private 
uh, companies like the Tiger Energy Solution. And of course, University of Missouri is also putting in dollars into this project. So the ultimate goal for us, at least, for this project, Mr. ABC and, and producing biofuels using the floodplains is, or can be summarized into 10, 10, 10, 8, and 24. Let me explain what they, what they really mean. 10% of the marginal land base established in biomass feedstock crops. That is a goal that can be accomplished. We do have landowners looking for alternative crops on land like that I explained to you earlier. And here is an opportunity for them to utilize such marginal lands and make an economic return. So we can convert at least 10% of this marginal land, and that will solve one of the major bottlenecks that I identified, availability of that biomass on a sustainable basis. We are also shooting for 10% increase, or tenfold increase, not 10%, tenfold increase in saccharification efficiency, that is conver conversion of that cellulose into sugar. That is what we call the saccharification process. And that will solve another major technological bottleneck. Well, in the near term, we are hopeful that we can help establish 10 advanced rural biorefineries or arbors. The scale-up strategy that I was talking about earlier, the decentralized production processing system. And it has been proven. And I named some of the BCAP project areas. And they are successfully showing that that model can work. We just need to replicate them in rural communities up and down the river corridor. I told you that in the near term, we can have up to 150 million gallons of advanced biofuel, but the river corridor has enough biomass. Or in other words, we can produce enough biomass on a sustainable basis from the river corridor to produce up to 8 billion gallons of advanced biofuels. 8 billion gallons. And that is 38% of that ISO's, ISO goal that I explained to you earlier in my talk. And this could be a national model for advanced biofuel production. This river corridor could be the Saudi Arabia of biomass and biofuel for us. And look at this number here, 24. Could be a $24 billion net economic impact in the river corridor where it is much needed. These rural communities need that sort of an economic boost. And this arbor model can bring jobs back to rural communities and revitalize the economy. Well, it's not only jobs, but also keep that in mind that we can also clean up our river systems. So jobs, clean air, and clean water. If we can make this dream a reality. So I will leave you with this slide. And I will read it, and I would encourage you to read it along with me. I believe that the great creator has put ores and oil on this earth to give us a breathing spell. As we exhaust them, we must be prepared to fall back on our farms, which is God's true storehouse and can never be exhausted. We can learn to synthesize material for every human need from things that grow. A great quote from Missouri's own George Washington Carver. Thank you very much. Go ahead, sir. So how does these how do these crops compare with solar energy? The sun is the worst and most energy. We photosynthesis. 
Uh huh. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, solar yield must be the key number. Oh. Yeah. Well, some of these crops are C4 crops, like C4 grasses, and they are much more efficient in fixing CO2 and fixing sun's energy, as we know. But some of them are C3, like the trees. If you look at plants in general, and if you look at the, you know, the conversion efficiency of solar energy into biomass or photosynthate, well, it is very, very low, one to three percent. And if you ask me, you know, what is the difference in like switchgrass versus cottonwood or miscanthus versus willow, Unfortunately, I don't have the numbers, but again, it is very low, I can tell you that, one to three. So, but they are all, you know, when you look at the growth that you see in them, some of them are much more efficient, like switchgrass, you may get six to eight tons at the most. Well, Miss Candace may give you 15, double that. So obviously there is a difference. Some of them are much more efficient than others. But if you are asking for that percentage conversion efficiency of solar radiation, particularly the photosynthetically active radiation, I don't have those numbers handy. But I can, maybe you can give me your, your email or phone number and I can look that up and then give you an answer later. Yes. Well, it's not advanced biomass, but it's more like advanced biofuels. Well, the advanced biofuels are defined in terms of their greenhouse gas emissions. So at least 60% reduction compared to the regular fossil-based fuels. If we can accomplish that, when you burn, well, the overall footprint of, of a biofuel, then it can be classified as advanced. So most of the first generation didn't meet because they came from like corn-based ethanol, for example. If you look at the greenhouse gas emissions from corn-based ethanol, well, I don't remember exactly the number, but it, it does not come close to 60% reduction compared to like regular gasoline. If you look at butanol, for example, produced from biomass, well, it is 60% or better. Even cellulosic ethanol. And when you think about, you know, the energy for producing some of these crops and the carbon footprint, you can see, you can, you can understand the difference. Growing corn versus growing switchgrass. Switchgrass, you plant it once. You may fertilize maybe every three years depending on the soil. And if it is like the way I explained, you know, if you plant in that corner of your field where there is plenty of water, nutrients accumulate, well, you may not have to fertilize. You may get them through the runoff. So your production cost is much low. Your carbon footprint for producing that crop is much low. Well, you can harvest every year. Once a year, or in some cases, you can harvest even twice a year. In some models, you know, you can harvest it like through midsummer, and you can use it for forage, for cattle, and then you can wait for the second crop to be harvested for biomass, for bioenergy. So it will depend on what sort of market you have available. So if you have a biomass market, well, you can harvest twice and use it for the biomass market. But if, like last year, if there is a shortage of hay, that market may give you more economic return and, and some of it could be harvested early and used for that purpose as, as hay. And the later harvest can go into 
the biofuels market. So the market demand will dictate, you know, the harvesting strategies, I believe. But it is, pro it is possible to harvest twice with those grasses. But the trees, no, you harvest only every two years at the most. Willows every two years, cottonwood, you could harvest every two years, but it may be more like every three years. But the grasses, definitely you can harvest every year, and in some cases, twice a year. Yes? Well, the question is about ultimate soil depletion. You know, in crop rotation, well, you keep on rotating in, in, in our usual farming scenario, you rotate corn, soybean. Well, in this case, it's just one single crop. So the question is, you know, how does that affect the soil productivity in the long run? Well, there have been studies conducted by multiple universities, and one of them comes to mind uh, from University of Tennessee where they have looked at uh, long-term sustainability. And what they have found is, you know, for 15, 16 years, you can keep harvesting from that one planting that you did. Well, you are removing a lot of biomass. And that's why I said you need to be cautious about studies like that. It depends on what kind of site where you are growing these biomass crops on. If it is productive soil where you could grow corn, soybean, well, that productivity is going to last for a while because these crops, they take nutrients, but if you wait until they senesce, that is, rather than harvesting twice, you wait until the first freezing and then you harvest, like in October, November, they will put many of the nutrients they took up back into the root systems. Again, that is a perennial crop strategy. So they will recycle some of those nutrients. But still, you may get to a point where you may have to supplement some nitrogen or some nutrients. But you can also do something like mixed plantings, along with switchgrass, Indian grass, big blue. You also plant some leguminous plants that can fix nitrogen. And if you can keep them in the system, and keep in mind, you know, most of these leguminous plants are early successional species. The grasses can choke them out eventually. But if you can maintain them, then they will supply the nitrogen that you need in that particular system without applying any external nitrogen into the system. So there are ways, and we are exploring all these options. How long can you go without depleting the soil productivity? And are there ways by which we can maintain the productivity longer without supplementing the soil nutrients? So we are investigating all these possibilities. I don't think we have all the answers, but eventually, hopefully in the next few years, we will have some of these answers. Yes? True, true. Well, I, I don't have, I don't think I have a good answer for that. I wish my policy colleagues were here to help me with answering that question. Uh, yes, you, you are right. And I was also asked a question last week, in fact, when I gave a similar talk that was kind of similar, that, well, 
you are talking about bringing the cost of biofuels down. Keep in mind, if you do that, the price of gasoline will also go down, maybe to a greater decrease, and, and you may be out of the market pretty soon. Will that scenario happen? I don't know. Jet fuel used to be about $25 but that price is coming down. Well, regular jet fuel you can buy for, who are the pilots in, in this group? You know, $3.50 you can buy jet fuel, less than that. Well, airlines were paying up to $16, $25 to buy biofuels because in some parts of the world, they need to show that they are really decreasing their carbon footprint. So there may still be a market. We may still be able to sell biofuels, but for many of us, if this needs to be a reality, the price should be competitive. Well, I don't think I answered your question directly, but again, I wish I had my colleagues here to help me with your question. Uh, well, back there. Yeah, um, biochar is, well, I don't want to say that it is like charcoal, but it is much finer. So essentially it is like charcoal, but much finer. So it can be a byproduct from some of the gasification process, like the thermochemical conversion, if you are using biomass like switchgrass or woody biomass, to, to gasify that and, and then convert that into some sort of fuel, well, the byproduct is char or biochar. Well, the, the beauty of biochar is that if you add that as a soil, uh, well, if you add that into the soil, not as a fertilizer, but as a soil amendment, you know, then that will increase the soil fertility because you are adding carbon and you are increasing the soil chemical property. The soil will have better cation exchange capacity, will be able to hold nutrients better, improve the soil organic carbon in general, and, and so a lot of benefits. And so that is a byproduct that can come out of the bio-based industry, which could help boost soil productivity. Well, it's also, yes, yes. So it actually puts that carbon into the soil for long-term storage. So in a way, yes, if you are asking about carbon sequestration, yes. So that carbon is then fixed and, and brought into the soil and it stays there. Yes, that's what I said, you know, that is a byproduct when you gasify woody biomass or, or, or herbaceous biomass. If you go that thermochemical route, in some cases, if, if that is what you do, then that you get as a byproduct. So that is an additional benefit. That byproduct then can go into the soil, sequester carbon. Yeah. Yes. Yes, and that is again, keep in mind that 60% reduction is in comparison to the regular gasoline. So the regular gasoline has a footprint, you know, how much carbon is emitted. And
there is still greenhouse gas emissions, right? And that's why we talk about, you know, that regular gasoline as the baseline and how much reduction do you see. And that reduction could be accomplished through various steps, including, you know, like the growing of that crop, the harvesting, the processing, and the conversion and the burning. Not necessarily just slowing down, but it is an actual reduction. Think about how much energy goes into, you know, like you're looking, you're looking at the carbons, you know, the carbon uh, life cycle here. So look into, you know, like how much energy goes into producing corn or soybean versus how much energy goes into producing, and I'm talking about, you know, like, you know, the fuel that we use, the manpower, everything and compared to like a crop like switchgrass or, or cottonwood. How many times do you have to go back into the field with your equipment if you are growing corn or soybean? Versus how many times you go when you have switchgrass as a crop? You plant it once. There's also fertilizer from there. Well, well, yes, fertilizer or the other input associated with producing like corn versus, or you know, burning that fossil, bringing that out compared to, you know, switchgrass. Yes? I, I think I mentioned that earlier. Yeah, and that is, that is, that is, that is a real, you know, point of concern because I mentioned earlier that once it is sugar, it can go into any number of processes that are already existing. And at that point, will it come to the biofuels market or will that sugar go into bourbon? Yeah. And I told you about the butanol story earlier because, you know, it is a drop in fuel, but if you can get $6 by selling to the chemical industry, why would you sell that to the fuels market for $2? So these are, these are real questions and, and, well, I did not really get into the policy aspect of the whole framework that I discussed. And that is, well, another, you know, full-blown talk in itself. And, and we can talk all night long about the policy and how will the policy drive the different directions. Well, most of that you saw today, it is policy driven. But policy can drive it even further or it, the policy can kill the whole thing. And so, well, we did not even talk about it. We didn't even bring up that topic today. But it's all assuming that, well, we still have strong policies favoring biofuels. If not, you know, many of you, I'm sure you remember what happened in the 90s, early 90s. We were talking about biomass, biofuels, and all these things in, 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 you know, with big dreams. Then everything collapsed. But this time it has stayed longer. And end users, and I think that is the key, end users have bought into that idea. And it is not just the U.S. this time, it is global. And there are a lot more benefits that people see globally for a bio-based economy, not just here in the U.S. And everybody's trying to reduce the carbon footprint and the airline industry in particular. They may benefit from, you know, biofuels. Well, we may talk about like natural gas. Nobody asked me that question about natural gas. Um, but if natural gas becomes dirt cheap like it is, well, do we really need a liquid transportation fuel from biomass then at that point? Well, the airline industry may still need it. They may still have to use biofuels made from biomass, at least for the foreseeable future. So there is still, there is still that demand for biofuels. A lot of uh, 
industrial folks are setting up shops to take advantage of that. And I for one hope that you know, the, the industry emerges and we can accomplish some of these goals that we have set for the bio-based emerging economy, particularly in the river corridor where we will benefit. Yes, I don't know how, many, how much time we have, but I'm sure I can take a couple of more questions. Yes. You are absolutely right. We do have a project that is jointly funded by Department of Energy in the U.S. and the Government of India in India. One of their agencies is called Department of Biotechnology. So we have this joint project where we are exploring the same concept in India and, and utilizing marginal lands. You are absolutely right. You know, they have year-round, 12-month growing season and capture a lot more solar energy, longer duration and grow a lot more biomass, which can be converted. And the Arbor model, the decentralized production processing system, can be a great model for rural India. So we are working with some of the Indian institutions. It is a $24 million project overall, half and half in each country, with multiple partners. So we are excited about that project, and we just finished the first year of that project. And it is a five-year project, and so you are absolutely right. There's a lot of potential for tropical countries to produce biofuels. Yes? That, that is exactly what we are exploring in our third objective, looking at sustainability, you know, looking at the ecological or environmental, social, and economic sustainability. So we are that economic or not economic, environmental impact is part of it. Uh, well, we can hypothesize, based on the data, I showed you that we can reduce pollution in our river systems. And I only showed the data for nitrogen, but we have data to show that phosphorus reduction into the rivers and streams, and even veterinary antibiotics. And we do have in Missouri a, a vibrant cattle industry, right? 80% of the anti antibiotics that we feed or, or give the animals come through the other end and deposit it on the surface. And where do they eventually end up? In the water. But we have shown that these same grasses and trees can filter them and some of the microbial communities associated with trees like cottonwood can decompose them, disintegrate them much faster because those special specific microbial communities use them for their carbon. So they will disintegrate them and they will not reach the water bodies. So, you know, a lot of chemical cleaning can happen. And go ahead, go ahead. Yes, I, wa I was about to say that, yeah. Yeah, and, and that again, I, I told you that we may be decades away from bringing any of those kind of plants into production. But if you look at, you know, most of our plants like the switchgrass, Indian grass, big blue, they're all bunch grass. So if you are thinking about planting those sort of grasses, they may look dense on the top, but still they leave a lot of room for critters to move around like coil, for example, or other creatures. So they can create good wildlife habitat. So what we think, at least based on you know, what our vision is, if you have scattered plantings 
throughout the landscape with these trees and grasses. They would act as corridors connecting our fragmented woodlots here and there in the river floodplain, effectively increasing the size of the habitat so wildlife can move even further. Is that a good thing? Well, I think it is a good thing, but will everybody think it is a good thing? Probably not, because you may see more wildlife in your farm fields if that happens. But you can, you can clearly see that these early successional, for example, willows and cottonwood, they can create a lot of habitat for birds and even for other wildlife. So if we could hypothesize that First of all, you increase the effective size of the habitat overall, and you create new habitat. You create corridors, connectivity. All these, all these good landscape terminologies come to mind if we have something like this on our landscape. So overall, it could be a good thing for wildlife. Yes? Well, th these are great questions. And again, I don't claim that I have the answers for them. But I go back to my earlier statement that we are not targeting, we have a lot of land. As you saw, when I define marginal based on those definitions, we have 116 million acres of land. And one thing in that analysis we did was we did not include any of the CRP lands, for example land already set aside for conservation. We were trying to look at mostly land that is classified as crop land, but that is marginal. Well, the last three years we lost a lot of land because You're absolutely right, yeah. Yeah, so that is happening. And we did not consider that kind of land because we, we didn't want to compete the conservation need, so we, we deliberately avoided that land in our calculations. But you're absolutely right. There is a possibility. People could start planting if there is that economic incentive, if there is that market, if they see they can produce money out of you know, that, that land that is always flooded or wetlands. Yes, there is, that, there is always that possibility. But well, with proper, and that's where we also have, I did not really go into it, we are also, envisioning an excellent outreach program. You know, like teaching people what kind of land is suitable, where do you make the best uh, return on your investment, and what kind of scenarios, you know, what kind of sensitive habitats you may want to avoid. So we hope that it's not going to be like pretty much planting everywhere, but only on sensitive lands, particularly on farmlands where you are not really making any money where you have areas like the one that I showed in the picture. But once we start there, I can always, I can see your concern clearly. And we have thought through it. And hopefully we can avoid scenarios like that. Well, I'm not saying that, you know, that wouldn't happen for sure, but at least we can educate the farmers, the landowners better. And, and at least show them some scenario analysis. But is that going to do it? I don't know. Only time will tell. But again, that is not, I can tell you that, that's not 
the intention, at least that we have. We would like to leave, you know, the sensitive habitats uh, out of uh, the area that we, that we cal calculated. At least that's the intent. Yes. Do you have any thoughts on the chicken and egg problem? Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> what, is that the $100 million dollar biofuel from these special crops? Mm-hmm. You can certainly use those special crops. Yeah. The chances are growing when these plants are ready to run. You're absolutely right. It is a chicken or egg issue because the industry is waiting the refineries are waiting for the landowners to plant first, but the, pla the landowners are waiting for the industry to come and set up shop and, and show the demand for biomass first. So who will come first? So what we call is a coordinated dance. It has to be industry working with landowners, not just the industry that is involved in the biorefinery, but all the way from the end user so that's why we formed this consortium to bring all the players together so that we can, we can work together, gaining, you know, trust, mutual trust. But it is still, yeah, it is still very early and we are still going through that chicken or egg phase. And that's one of the reasons why you are not seeing the arbors popping up everywhere. It, it, looks great in concept, but in reality, well, it is very difficult. The industry is looking for availability of the biomass, but well, the farmers won't get into it unless they see the demand for that biomass, the guarantee that somebody's going to take their biomass and use it for something. So it is, we, we are still working on it. I'm not saying that we have all the answers yet, but at least we are recognizing the, you know, the, the issues better at this point and trying to solve them the best we can, trying to bring everybody together and, and, and talk about it and find solutions for it. Okay, um, well, I think we have one more question and then we will wrap up. Well, we, we are hopeful that, you know, like from about 10% of that land base, but we have to do many things to make that 8 billion a reality. You know, we have to increase productivity considerably. And that's one way by which we can reduce the amount of land that is needed. So we need to improve the productivity considerably on that 10% land base. And I did not really mention that, but our, our goal, ultimate goal is to improve productivity to 25 dry tons per acre per year on an average. And that's not by boosting productivity of every, every species. Some of them may be at 35 and some of them may be at 20, and, and, but on an average, if you look at that corridor, we can say, yep, per acre, we can produce about 25 dry tons per acre per year. Eight billion is, like I showed you, 38% of our ISA goal of the 21 billion gallons that roughly, you know, 21 billion gallons that we need to produce. Well, right now, how much are we producing? As I said earlier, less than half a million gallon. So for the advanced biofuel, what is the demand? I tried to show you with all those numbers from DOD and FedEx and United, everybody has got a target. So the demand could be, at this point, at least, a few millions. We are producing about 13 billion gallons of ethanol from corn, that we know. But the less than half a million gallon, well, 
that is being used. And we are seeing now real targets, like United in July announced that they will start using about 15 million gallons of jet fuel in three years. So we've just started seeing solid targets like that. EPA has estimates, you know, we have goals of 500 million gallons like last year, for example. That was not based on, that was based on estimates. Well, if we had, let's, let's think about the scenario. If we had produced 500 million gallons of advanced biofuel, would have used it? Do you think we would have used all of it? Probably, because DOD is still, you saw that, DOD is still a major user, and they have these hefty targets. So they could have probably used it. Let's say we produce five billion gallons this year. No, I don't think they will be able to use all of that. So we are slowly, again, that's also another chicken or egg, supply versus demand. That also has to be a coordinated dance, but we are seeing now the end users coming forward and, and declaring that this is the target, real target. When United says, you know, that's what they are targeting. And again, that's not like billions. It's a small number, very modest expectation, you know, 15 million gallons in three years. That is a start. So that could be, you know, if everything goes as planned, like our Energy Independence and Security Act, well, we will be producing 21 billion gallons of advanced biofuels in about less than 10 years, in nine years. Well, we all know that if we make the progress the way we've been making progress, we are not going to get there. But it could happen. In two years, we may see a major breakthrough in technology. Who knows? We may, we may meet all our needs. Well, I'm dreaming here, def definitely, but you know, we may meet all our needs from biomass-based biofuels. If there is a major breakthrough like that, well, with the progress, like I said, we are making today, I personally don't believe that we will meet those expectations in less than 10 years. But the potential, I was just trying to show the potential that we have as a region for producing up to 8 billion gallons based on the biomass and based on the land base that we have. Okay? Well, is it time to wrap up? Well, I can, I can stay back again and answer a few more questions. Thank you all very much.